a few words about the syllables that we chanted, om, ah, hum, hu, and how it relates to the energy body. So, <coughs> om, mantra, that is the most common one, relates to the, you know, usually if you, if you buy a yoga book, they introduce six, seven chakras from the um, root chakra, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These seven in this area, in the spine, from the pelvic floor to the crown, crown right? Mm -hmm. This is the most common uh, chakra system that is uh, spoken about. So the main um, vibration, main sound, main mantra for that system is OM. It has a, quite a peaceful, peaceful feel to it. Then, uh, uh, you know, in open heart Bumi model, we have these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven centers above the head. And, um, how it relates to our Bumi system is that we have these six small ones here inside the head between the level of the eyes and crown. So first six are here and next four, you know, these ten Bodhisattva Bumis all together um, are the ten Bodhisattva Bumis and more specifically seven, eight, nine and ten, these centers relating to these seven through ten bumis relate to mantric syllable hu. Hu. And this is wrathful. This is peaceful, om. This is wrathful. It has a different... What, it, what the wrathfulness means is that <coughs> it has a... like a... Um, more active, more fierce tone to it. Uh, and of course you know that in our deities, in open heart yoga, <coughs> in Tibetan heart yoga, there are peaceful and wrathful deities. Right? So <coughs> our deities are just expansion of all of these mantras. We also have actually a um, Guru Menla, which is medicine Buddha, um, which is peaceful, but it also has the uh, active element of healing in it. Uh, and we have a um, couple of red deities, Vajra Yogini and Kurukulla in Kurukulla in, in uh, third empowerment, which are um, deities of passion. So they relate to desires, sexual desire being the strongest one of desires. So peaceful, wrathful, healing, passionate. Peaceful, bright color, wrathful, dark colors, dark blue, black. Um, then healing, healing color can be, um, you know, deep blue, deep blue, bright blue, usually, and um, passionate red. So, anyway, back to this. And in our system we have Bumis 11, 12 and 13 that relate to these so-called, these centers, high above the head, the so-called Mahasiddha Bumis, Bumis of full attainment. So this 11th Bumi relates to A, sound A. And also, when all of this, this whole system, this whole energy complex is purified, this is the first, this center is the, uh, relates to the first <coughs> stage of Buddhahood. You become fully enlightened, your mind is fully pure, 
you become a Buddha of the first stage. Nirmanakaya Buddha. A mind pure uh, inside a body. And um, at this point, I can also, having gone through Om, Hum and A, ah, these three syllables are, the, are very used in Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism. They always say Om, A, ah, Hum, something. They speak of three Vajras, three indestructible syllables. Uh, but this goes up to eleven. Like that, the old joke from Spinal Tap movie. <laughs> uh, so our system goes up to eleven. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I have never never checked or asked what the syllable for twelfth boom is, but the, but the syllable for thirteenth is who. That's why, you know, we have the addition of who. And um, so that is the, you know, ultimate attainment there is, like body attainment, that has been attained by him, by her, and a large group of other uh, people. Large group of others who were people who became masters. So <coughs> here we have the first stage of Buddhahood. Refer uh, correlating to purity of mind, completely transformed, purified samskaras, karmas, habits, tendencies, what have you. The twelfth bhumi, uh, relate, attainment wise, it uh, relates to uh, small light body, which means that um, uh, after this first stage of Buddhahood, um, if you manage to um, transform some of your physical body, when you die, it can shrink to a small size. There are photographs you can find online from recent practitioners and many written accounts throughout the centuries that um, a person who attained so-called small rainbow body their bodies shrink, like to a baby-sized body, but the proportions is the same as with adult. So it just shrinks during about seven, eight, nine days after the heart stops beating. Um, also, I would say that this is um, like explained in different ways. Some add additional boomies, additional stages, but I would say that there is another, like a, a bit more evolved stage of rainbow body, light body, where um, the um, nails and hair are left behind. So otherwise the body uh, disappears, the physical body disappears. So that's, I, I think it's still small rainbow body can be put under, under, under that category. And then there's the ultimate one, which um, there's no remains at all, no physical remains at all. And there are accounts of all of these, some of them recent, uh, some of them, I guess you would say ancient. This, this one is Full rainbow body is, is quite rare. The I think the best be, I think best two accounts of that would be uh, Ramalinga from su southern India. He was a Hindu saint who left his body in 1880, 1880 I think. There are you know written accounts of those who were present and even some official accounts from local police when it happened. Um, so you can check that if you like. And another one I found recently from a Taoist master, who's the student who wrote it down is still alive. He lives, lives in the States, this Chinese man. Uh, you can find, find this, this account from the blog, I added it there. So there was this 
Chinese really old Taoist master who had practiced all his life. And then he was something like 115 years old, very old. Um, and um, he said that he would leave soon. And he actually added that if I'm not going to take rainbow, then you can just forget everything I've ever said. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, his students, some local people were invited to the temple. There was some, you know, music, ritual music, and so on. And this old yogi was sitting on a throne, and he just turned into a like a reddish light. People saw that he lifted from the ground. There was reddish light, sort of like spinning really fast and then it was gone. I've never witnessed such a thing myself, but... When was that? How long ago was that? There's no uh, year told in that account, but this Baolin Wu, the Chinese student who wrote it, wrote it down, he's still alive in the States. I think he's something like uh, maybe 70 years old now. Uh, and he was very young when it happened, something like uh, 13, 14 years old. So, 50s, 60s, something like that. But what is also wonderful about that account, I feel that um, rainbow body is a universal phenomenon. Um, well, there's the story of Jesus, pretty famous story of his resurrection <laughs> and um, um, a couple of years ago I've, I found somebody writing on a Buddhist, Buddhist bulletin board um, who, ha who was from Romania or some other country, some other Eastern Orthodox country and he, he knew that uh, um, in that area, in that country where he was from, there were these Eastern Orthodox uh, ascetics, these fathers, monks, who, you know, there were many, many examples how they have attained small rainbow body. Their body shrank. And um, if I remember right, he also told that there were examples where it was said in Christian terms that this or that monk was taken by the father with his physical body. So there was no remains. But uh, um, as far as I know, I'm not, um, I don't know anybody from that tradition. Uh, and I think it's very secretive. So these things are not discussed openly in the Hesi, Hesychastic tradition of Christianity. But apparently, you know, there are hundreds of desert fathers, Christian ascetics who have attained small or even full rainbow body throughout the centuries. So it is universal. It's not only something that uh, Chokchen practitioners with Buddhist background talk about. And I think that's, that's really nice. That's really wonderful about it. What type of practices would they practice? Christians? Yeah. The, the main Hesychasm practice is the... Do they call it the heart prayer? Prayer of the heart? Which goes something like... Um, I have to translate this in my head from Finnish. It's... Uh, <coughs> O Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, who am a sinner. It goes something like this. It's a, they use it like a mantra. Mm -hmm. That's the main practice. But I hear that they also use some breath practices, some other stuff. But I don't know. Otherwise. What did you call it, Kim? Hesychastic? It? Uh, it's Hesychasm. H-E-S-Y C-H- ASM, Hesychasm. 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 Yeah.
So when we chant Om Ah Hum Hu, it's just like a combination of peaceful, wrathful, and then these Masida Bumi vibrations. Yeah. Sorry, Kim, does that mean that when we 7 to 10, the home corresponds to wrathful? Yes. Yeah. think you can handle it? <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> you think it's funny, but I, when we, if we continue... So that chanting game, is, is that purifying then? What do you think? Well, that's its purpose. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And actually, the, like the genius of of combining these four is that, uh, you know, commonly in different systems they might only chant OM or they might only chant A, ah. but combining it, it makes, it makes like an interesting uh, mixture of different vibes so that we have the, those, those pure vibrations within the aura, which is where the karmas are, we have that, and also we have this pure vibration being infused at the same time, ah and who. So it's an interesting, like a, like a really nice formula of different vibrations. And the reason why I asked that, do you still you can... Do you, do you think you can still handle it? Is because uh, it can be really tiring and exhausting because it really it, it can be very intensive energetically. But we can do more if you can, if you want. Do you think were they originally meant to be done very long, drawn out? Do you think that's much more effective? Um, well, originally, doesn't really matter, mm. uh, but that is one way of doing it. Uh, what I like about chanting long syllables uh, is that it engages the, the body in a certain way. When you chant, just like we in brief mentioned, or mm, the, the long m's in, in om and hum, they vibrate in the body, they make the bones really, bones and muscles, mm -hmm. uh, you know, gently vibrate. But this bone vibration is, is quite important. Um, yeah, just, that's just one way of doing it that I think is, is very effective. How does Vam relate to this? Is that oh, the so in, um, in our tantric practices, the, the deities have been grouped with the uh, Avam syllables, so that the uh, peaceful, Deities are grouped under A and wrathful ones under Bam. And then on second empowerment, there are more wrathful deities, which comes with the third syllable. With the third empowerment, more wrathfuls that come under the fourth syllable. That's how. But they're not corresponding then necessarily to 
boomies or groups of boomies. It's more today. It, is. Uh, it does. It does actually. There are uh, pairs like um, Guru Rinpoche's and Yeshe Tsogyal's uh, deity pairs for 13th, 12th, and 11th boomies. Um, and then, then uh, other than that, they don't specifically refer to certain um, boomies or centers. It's just that the whole, whole vibration of it. Did this discussion clarify your understanding about the practices we have done before? Mm-hmm. Do you understand it better now, technically? It took me a long, long time, many years, to figure this out. Many sleepless nights, many tears, (laughs) so much sweat. (laughs) How did you figure it out? Well, I I didn't figure it out without my masters, but... um, um, but like learning some bits here and there um, and then combining it what I learned from them directly that's how and also through a lot of lot of practice myself so can if you are say uh, at Boomi 4 or Boomi 8 or Boomi 12. Mm. Um, and you've Oma Hum Hu, right? Uh, so let's say you're, you're 8, right? So the chanting of Hum, does that relate d- directly to that then? Or does one actually chant the full? Does it re- relate directly to what? Does it relate directly to, like, I mean, is, is, is it if you just actually, you're, you're chanting hum all the time, is that of benefit in, if you're there? Or is it is there just benefit from om, hum, hu? I see. So... Is it concentrated, you know? It, it could be done that way, that... Uh, you could only chant any of these single, any of these syllables, uh, <coughs> just using one of them. Mm. But that's what I was kind of saying that uh, with the tantric mantras, avam, and possibly you know the next two syllables, and um, or om ah hum hu, it creates a mixture that covers the whole system. That was kind of my point, that uh, you could, and there are systems where they only chant OM, but it only works on a certain area. And this is actually, what happens is that if you only chant an OM, which relates to the centers inside the body, these ones, uh, when that system of centers would be purified, um, it wouldn't stop having an effect. It would a little bit seep into the rest of the energy system. But it's kind of like a, when you have a piano and you press this, what do you call it? A yeah, co- a sustain. A sustain pedal. You put it down and you play one note strongly. 
many other notes start playing gently. Do you know that? Mm. Know what I'm talking about? Mm. So you hit, keep hitting one note, that ohm note, and it makes all the other notes play a little bit, but not properly. That's exactly, if you only use ohm, ohm mantra or mantras arising from that ohm, uh, that's what happens. But it's better to put down the pedal and <laughs> <laughs> go free jazz on the keyboard. That's the idea. And we actually experienced this. The reason why we switched from like a, a Hindu-based Kriya Yoga to Buddhism years ago, to Buddhist um, theory, was because myself and a few practitioners in our, our Sangha came to that point when we couldn't uh, get much benefit from the practice because it was own based It didn't plateau completely, but it kind of strongly plateaued. That's when we made the shift. So that you were on based really that's all that's what you were that's the chant you were using, yeah? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that was strictly Hindu. Um, well sure, we used the uh, like Hindu Dharma context. Hindu theory. Yeah. Which is it's many of many of it is really close to Buddhism. But Buddhism kind of explains it. Explains it. Uh, sets up the practice a little differently. Like for example, refuge which is the main thing in Buddhism. It's also there in Hinduism, through this devotion. You take refuge all the time. But the way how Buddhists do it is it's just a bit more formal or like set up in a different way. So like really the practices of in Hindu Tantra or Buddhist Tantra are more or less the same. It's the same channels, the same centers. Um, well, the deities have some energetic difference, but it's all heading the same way, you know. Uh, the difference be between the main difference between Hinduism and Buddhism is that uh, Buddhism is based on based on vipassana which refers to emptiness principle in in like in a minor way in hinduism there is the same principle in advaita inquiry self inquiry inquiry that's the same vipassana principle jnana yoga But that's the main difference between Hinduism and Buddhism. But when it comes to tantric practices, yeah, it's you know same same principles. And with these mantras, do you do you purify one bhumi at a time, or is this purifying many bhumis at the same time? Okay. This mantra, yeah, oh, many at the same time, all of them at the same time, just like in. Uh, our tantric mantras, because it's all, all combined. How would you know if you have uh, if you perfected it? Well, we have the thirteen pure land jhanas. Um, I gave the last empowerment I've given of it was last year in September. Um, and I haven't given it since, but it's um, people have asked me to give it this year, so I will give it this year at some point. But the, it's it's these meditations that you use um, a certain buddhas relating to each thir each of the thirteen bumis, and you meditate those buddhas one by one, and you can see whether your bumis are. Uh, just a little bit purified, more purified, 
even more purified or whether it's completely gone when it's perfect. Is, is there some reaction you get? Yes. Right. Yes. Bliss, bliss um, like an ecstatic sensation is the main one. And that's actually actually a very good very good to remember um, practicing this love and devotion. So if you get blissful, ecstatic, like first like drunk, like drunk in a good way, that means that you have stuff in your system. You have karmic stuff in your system. What happens is that the charge. Um, it hits the whatever remaining stuff you have in the system and it causes ecstatic bliss. So in this situation bliss is not good, right? Yes. Uh, well, in a sense, bliss can be good because there's a lot of healing in bliss. You know, if somebody is very stressed out or traumatic or something, you know, uh, that bliss is very healing. It gives you uh, solace. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, it, it's good. Mm -hmm. But to op to to think that that bliss is the goal, it's it's a dead end. I know it from personal experience. <laughs> I practiced <laughs> practiced uh, in that that way for years and at some point started thinking, wait a second, wait a second, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a dead end as such. But you get rid of the bliss by practicing more vipassana, which means, in other words, that when bumis get perfected, you will have less and less bliss, you will just have this wonderful clarity. Buddha nature. I, I'm not sure if I understand how love can be missing from that if you have that, if you can have the natural state switched on a lot or be in that clarity. Surely, <clears throat> like that, would, like love wouldn't be missing from that. Like, yeah, but that's exactly that's that's a that's a completely valid you know train of thought, but because <clears throat> um, the path is about recognizing the nature of mind, uh, familiarizing with it, and mixing it with the samsaric mind. But there are like a... it's easier said than done. Uh, like uh, spiritual bypassing, uh, false assumptions, whatever, um, can make it not that obvious. <clears throat> so I'd like to get, the head, get your head around, isn't it? 
in, in terms of the <laughs> different um, yeah. yeah. You can take a picture of that if you like. To, to not forget it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I would rip my pants if somebody asked it next retreat. <laughs> <laughs> I would never come back. <laughs> no. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, let's take a break of ten minutes and then get back to practice.